Hello YouTube, Captain Mac here and welcome to the full flight tutorial for the PMDG 747 version 3. And that's right ladies and gentlemen, we picked this bad boy up the other day. It was an early Christmas present and I'm super excited about it. In fact, I was so excited about it that I decided to do a live stream flight with it yesterday. It was my very first flight in it. Hadn't flown it not even one time. All I did was set up controls. Did my very first flight. It was a nearly eight hour live stream. Had a lot of folks on there interacting. Learned a lot about the aircraft from a lot of you guys, which I really appreciate. And it was just a lot of fun. And I'm really looking forward to doing a bunch more flights in this aircraft. But um, before we can do that, we need to take care of a full flight tutorial first so that we don't have to go from cold and dark on every single flight. And yeah, so that should be good to go. Now, I don't know why Southwest Airlines has a plane over there, but uh, I do know that I put that paint scheme in there, which is one of the cool things about UT Live. I just want to throw out there really quick. Um, if you have custom paint schemes that you want to put into uh, UT Live as AI traffic, you can put them in there and they'll appear in there. So there's actually across the way, there's a there's a Cargo Lux uh, 747 over there as well. Now normally, Cargo Lux doesn't fly out of Phoenix, um, but hey, what the heck, I thought it'd be a good time anyway, so we decided we're going to fly out of Phoenix because we all know how much I like Phoenix. Uh, now, during that live stream, we had a lot of choppiness with this aircraft, and you can see there's just a tiny bit of it now as well. And the simple fact of the matter is, is this sucker is really heavy on the frames. It is. Even in P3D, it's a bit of a butt kicker, but it's nowhere near as bad. I mean, for the most part, it's very smooth. We have a pretty heavy scenery here and a lot of traffic going on and all that stuff. But anyway, enough about that. Uh, the flight today is from Phoenix up to San Francisco, both flight beam sceneries, and I'm looking forward to doing this flight with you. So what do you say we hop on the flight deck and we start learning how to get this bad boy fired up? Oh, quick disclaimer before I forget because I almost always forget. Or actually, no, I don't forget anymore. I just almost forgot this time. Anyway, uh, <laughs> this is a full flight tutorial. And what that means is that it does not in any way encompass every aspect of this aircraft, especially an aircraft like this. That's just way too much. I'm looking at the FCOM over here um, on a different computer. And the FCOM is 1,606 pages long, guys. So a full flight tutorial is about how to get the aircraft, take it from a cold and dark state, get it up in the air, get it back on the ground properly, and take it back to a cold and dark state. That's what we're doing with a full flight tutorial. We are not including every possible uh, scenario or anything like that in this type of tutorial. I am considering some advanced flight tutorials for some of these more uh, advanced uh, aircraft, some of these aircraft that are that have more systems and stuff like that involved. If you guys are interested in maybe seeing some of those, let me know down in the comments and we might start looking at that in the future. Okay, enough talky talk. Now we're going to hop on the flight deck and get started. Alrighty folks, here we are on the flight deck and as you can see we've got our cold and dark as we expect. Now I did use the FMC function to put it in a cold and dark state which means we're going to get a little FMC message thing that's going to keep popping up whenever we hit recall in the future. Uh, and that is a glitch apparently um, and as far as I can tell PMDG is not doing anything about it. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I do want to throw a little bit of a frustration out there right away. Apparently Boeing has put a copyright on the manuals for this aircraft and therefore you cannot print them out. So I have to have the the checklist and manuals up on a separate screen here. Now I can make these screenshots and I might use these to make some printouts but for the purpose of this tutorial I'm going to be using uh, the PDF version on another la on my laptop over here and so that might slow things down just a hair but I'll try and edit out anything that takes too long because I don't want to drag it out these tutorials already get pretty long right so okay so going first things first we've got our electrical power up uh, bleh, our electrical power up checklist alright so first thing we need to do is we need to get the battery switch on and that guy is gonna be way up top here I can't, I can't get my brain to work right now. Battery switch is it's right in front of my face, but there we go. Battery switch on. Close the cover there. And then standby power selector. This guy here needs to go to auto. And then hydraulic demand pump selectors all need to be off. Okay, and that's down here. So here's the hydraulic pumps. These, uh, these are the engine pumps. These are the demand pumps. That's my understanding of it. Maybe I'm getting that wrong, but they're all in the off position, so we're good. Uh, windshield wiper selectors need to be off. Uh, where's the windshield wiper selector? Dirt. 
drawing a blank on that right now. It should be right in front. It's right in front of my face. There it is. I, I looked at all this already, and I flew the plane yesterday, but apparently I forgot where everything is already. Alternate flap selector needs to be off, and you'll be able to find that switch down here, kind of hidden up underneath the uh, main panel there. That's the alternate flap selector. <coughs> Landing gear, gear, bleh, landing gear lever needs to be down, which it is. Flap position indicator and flap lever need to agree with each other. So there's no flaps shown on here, and then the flaps are all the way up, so they do agree. Uh, and then it says to establish electrical power. So bus tie switches need to go to auto. <coughs> And uh, that's these four here. They're already in auto. And then what we want to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to bring external power onto the aircraft first. In order to do that, hop down here to your FMC, go to FS Actions and Ground Connections. Make sure that you've set the, the chocks. It's whichever one is, is highlighted larger. So that would be removed. That is set. And then request the ground power. And then we've got it set, I've got it set up so that they're animated, which means it's moving over there right now. It takes a minute. Uh, and also keep in mind, uh, so these service vehicles here, these are not compatible with uh, GSX. So if you're using GSX and you want to request these vehicles, they don't work together. So something to keep in mind. All right, hopping back up top then, external power is now available. So let's click that on on both of them since we're pretty much running out of juice on our battery there. There we go. Power is still on on the aircraft. And what do we got next? Uh, and so this is this is where it's going to be a little annoying because I have to kind of look over here on another screen. So then it talks about uh, if we want to turn on the APU and all that stuff. And we're not worried about that right now. So that's it for your electrical power-up checklist. All right, that's going to take us into our preliminary pre-flight procedure, which can be done by the captain or the first officer. And since we're filling both roles today, guess what? We're going to do all of it. First things first, IRS mode selectors off the nav. They should already be in the off position, which they are. So we'll just right click them twice to nav. And that's it. Easy enough, right? Voice recorder switch needs to be as needed. This one's all the way up top. This is your voice recorder up here. I don't think you can actually do anything with it other than test it. You could erase it, uh, but you test it there, you'll see the needle moves. See the needle move? There we go. Uh, you can plug in a headset there. You've got squib tests here and so on. Just so that you know, this panel is all the way up top. So if you've got Chase Plane or Easy Dock, you can set a camera setting for that one like I did. Then you should be good to go on that. That takes care of that portion. Uh, over to status display, we need to check this. So what this is talking about, using the lower ICUS here, pop this up so that you can see it nice and clear. And we need to check a few things on here. We need to check the oxygen pressure, the hydraulic quantity, and the engine oil quantity. So if you jump over here to status page, you can see your hydraulic quantity, your hydraulic pressure, okay, and then you've got your oxygen pressure down here for the crew and for the passengers, okay. Now, I don't know, I didn't read through all, I mean, this is just one manual, 1,600 pages, so I don't know what proper or adequate pressure or quantities are, but I'm going to assume that they're good to go. You can see the pressure is varying widely anyway, and I don't really know why. Probably because we don't have the hydraulics turned on at the moment. That's my guess. Anyway, then we also need to check the oil quantity. And if you click on the engine page there, your oil quantity is down here in quartz. So 22, 22, 22, and 21. Next is the flight deck access system. It says to put it in normal. I looked for this thing. I, I assume it's making sure the flight deck door is locked, but I can't even find a switch for that. So I don't know. I'm Maybe I'm missing something or whatever, but I can't find that. Circuit breakers, they're modeled, obviously, but they're not functional in the aircraft. Emergency equipment, fire extinguisher, crash axe, emergency escape devices, and all that other stuff. We're going to consider it stowed because, obviously, we won't really use it. Hatches closed and locked. Smoke evacuation handle, uh, we checked that. All that stuff's in the back back behind us. Uh, the, the escape hatch and stuff is above us. There's no, It doesn't do anything. You, I checked it. You can't move it. Nothing like that. So... We do want to make sure that the APU start source switch is on TR. And this one, again, is all the way up in this upper overhead, way up here. APU start source on TR. So, again, you might want to, you know, put a hotkey for this this panel way up here, all right? Uh, what's next on here? Uh, lower lobe cargo condition airflow rate selector as needed. I could have just stayed up here because that's up here as well. That's this one. And uh, we're just going to leave it in the off position because I don't think we need it. 
And then it says circuit breakers check again. And so you've got all these circuit breakers up here. You've got circuit breakers down here. I don't know if there's any on this side. I don't think so. There's a lot of circuit breakers to check. <laughs> but uh, none of them are actually doing anything. They're all just modeled. Nicely modeled, but just modeled all the same. And then parking brake as needed. We do have the wheel chocks on, but I like to put the parking brake on as well so that we know we're good on that. And that is going to take care of our preliminary pre-flight procedure. Now to me it feels a little out of order for some reason, but next on the checklist is the CDU pre-flight procedure, which is the captain and the first officer. So it's basically something that uh, they're supposed to do together because you're supposed to confirm everything. So if we hop down here for our CDU, and uh, we've got that one on the simulator menu there. Go over to FMC, and we need to put our IRS position in there. Go to page two. Grab this guy here. Back here, and you could you could grab this one as well, but either way, there we go. That's done, and then go to our route page. Now, I did put in a. Uh, route I did put the route uh, I put it together with PFPX and then I moved it to the appropriate folder um, so you can see there's one route in there so this is obviously the easy way to do it now in order to do this you create a route it has to be saved in PMDG's format and then you would need to save it to your PMDG uh, flight plans 747 folder and that's where you would find this at however because I know you guys are gonna want to see it we're not going to just grab this route but that is how you you grab a company route okay so one more time just in case you missed it request send request then you would go to your 747 folder and there you go now coincidentally you can also grab routes from the NGX folder and the 777 folder they're all in there so if you're using PFPX which doesn't save to the 747 folder, it does save to the NGX folder. So you could just save it in there and then request the route from the NGX folder and you'd be good to go. So not a problem there, right? Easy enough. Now let's go back here though and let's go ahead and build our route the old fashioned way. We're going to be going from Phoenix, so KPHX. This doesn't take too long anyway. KPHX and then we're going out to San Francisco, so KSFO. Here we go. Flight number for us is going to be 2336 because that's the one we like to use. Uh, I haven't checked the weather yet, so I don't know which runway we're using. So I'll look at that here in a minute. But anyway, well, let's activate. The, uh, actually, I don't want to activate it yet. Let's go to the next page. And uh, actually, we need departure and arrival first, don't we? My bad. I always do that, too. So once you've got those in there, um, you could activate it. I mean, click activate. And okay, now that's the primary route in there. Then go departure arrival. We're obviously looking at our departure right now, and we're scheduled to take the Chili 4 departure. So, Chili 4. And the active runways are 25 left and right, so we're going to be taking runway 25 left. Put that in there, and our transition will be at Hobbs or Hobbs. We'll go with Hobbs. All right, and then we go to our route page. So this takes us back to where we initialized the route, right? And then we go to page two, and you can see that Chili 4 with Hobes as the transition is already in there. And from there, we're gonna be taking J92, or J9 or two. Put that one in right there. And then the boxes mean that we must put something in there. So dash lines mean that it's not required. Boxes mean that it is. And that's gonna go out to Perfume. So P R F. UM, pretty sure we hit that waypoint actually uh, when we did our live stream the other day or yesterday. And then Q13, matter of fact, I know we hit these waypoints. Uh, where's Q? Q13, because we used Q13 as well. So we're going to use that airway out to Tumbe, T U M B E. T U M B E. And then Q162. Funny how this route's very similar to Kino. <laughs> it's almost identical, in fact, except for the start point. Get the O in there. There we go, out to Kino. And then Q15. And if you were watching the live stream yesterday, then you will know that that's going to take us to resume. R S E R R U S M E. There we go. And then from there, it's on to our arrival, which was which 
is scheduled for the always one arrival, which is the same one that we were on yesterday. So we'll activate that for now. We're not going to put the arrival in yet. Execute that and then go to our performance initialization page. Now, this is something that I learned yesterday. You need to um, accept the gross weight here, but we haven't done our fuel yet. So that's something uh, that we need to do right now. So I guess typically the right, the better way to do it is to do your fuel first before you start doing all this. I kind of got a little tied up as far as doing the tutorial, but uh, we can still do fuel here because we haven't accepted that gross weight yet. So if we go to FS Actions over here, go to Fuel, and then we're scheduled for 45,683 pounds of fuel. So 45,683. Put that up here. And you see that changed the gross weight here and over here because we haven't accepted it yet, right? And we can also do our cargo really quick. <coughs> so take a look. Hold on. <coughs> Excuse me. Got Matt cough for you there. Uh, let's see. So cargo... Uh, what did they say? Put your zero... Somebody told me this yesterday. So instead of trying to guess which cargo goes where, take my zero fuel weight off of my flight plan. So my flight plan shows what my zero fuel weight should be for the flight plan, which is 521.111. If I take that, 521.111, and I put that in here, it's going to adjust all the cargo for me and even it out. Invalid entry. Oh, I know why. Uh, so 521.1 <laughs> that's how we need to put it in there and there you go see it adjusted the cargo for us and adjusted our gross weight as well so that's how you do fuel and payload so those are done now and now we can go ahead and we can accept this so let's zip back over here so we get a little bit better view so we'll accept our gross weight our cruise altitude is going to be flight level 380 we're not heavy at all and then reserves what did we go with yesterday i don't remember i think we're going to go with uh let's just go with fifteen thousand for now i don't know if this thing actually simulates the unusable fuel or not <coughs> maybe somebody can answer that question cost index is going to be 85 and there we go that takes care of performance initialization moving over to the thrust limits page uh we're very light uh, we're going to go with a uh uh, I need to get top cat. <laughs> I'm going to need to get top cat uh, soon. If we do full takeoff, it's 108.4% on the N1. We don't need that. Uh, 103 at 10%. I don't think we need that either. We're, we're pretty darn light. So we're going to go with takeoff two and we're going to go climb one. And that's what we're going to go with. So we'll select that, arm that, and then go to the takeoff page. And standard flaps takeoff, I believe, is 10 on this one, right? I don't remember off the top of my head, but that's what we're going to go with. We're going to go with flaps 10. There we go. And then you see it put our V-speeds in there for us. So when I did the live stream before, I hadn't actually accepted that gross weight on that first page. And so it wouldn't pop up the V-speeds for me. It was driving me nuts. So let's go ahead and accept these. 126, 136, and 152. And I don't think we're going to have any problem reaching those on our runway so I think we probably chose uh, the appropriate thrust but we'll see we'll find out if I messed it up and if I did we're gonna know it uh, and then we're gonna leave that page up there and that takes care of all of the pre-flight for the CDU alright this is gonna take us into our pre-flight procedure for the first officer And what I want to do before we actually dive into this is I want to just go over this overhead panel real quick so that we understand where everything is. So starting up on the top left here, this is the electric engine control panel. Right below that is your IRS panel. And then this much larger panel, this is your electric panel. This is all electric switches. Below that is your hydraulic switches. And then below that is internal lighting switches. And that's not all the internal lighting, but some of them. And then come back up top here, we've got uh, I don't even know what you call this panel. Probably an emergency panel. You've got your uh, fire and overheat uh, engine tests, emergency lights, uh, audio systems, sort of a various panel. And then right below that, you've actually got your fire indicator warnings and fire suppression systems. Below that, this is our engine panel here. Okay, and this includes uh, fuel dump, fuel jettison panel. So those, those go together there. And then below that, we've got our fuel pumps. Below that is anti-ice and window heat, as well as the windshield wipers, windshield washer, all of that. 
Below that, this panel here is all external lighting. It's not all of the external lighting, but it is external lighting. Coming back up top, this we'll just call this the main deck signaling panel because it's the only thing on there. Right below that, you've got flight controls uh, stuff, w which really is just the yaw damper, and then you've got this is for uh, extra supernumerary oxygen. I don't know what that actually is, but it's something to do with oxygen, obviously. Uh, right below that, we've got our pressurization panel. Below that, we've got our uh, environmental control panel. So this is your um, your packs, well, part of your environmental control panel. This is your temperature and stuff like that, right? So flight deck uh, temperature and then main deck temperature and so on. And then below that is, um, I don't know what we'd actually call this one, to be honest with you. I'm sure there's a name for it, but I haven't looked it up. I'm just I'm using my own names here. But this is where your packs are. Uh, isolation switches and your bleed switches and then below that you have the rest of your external lighting all right and so the only reason I went over that in that fashion and again I, I know that I don't have all the names right or anything like that but the idea is to just show you that even though there's a lot going on up here it is broken down into sections and that should help at least a little bit with uh, navigating your way around this panel okay so diving in here then for the uh, first officer's pre-flight procedure the very first thing it says the ELT switch uh, guard closed. Now, uh, I don't know if it means emergency lights, but uh, if it does, that's incorrect. An ELT is an emergency locator transmitter or something like that, okay? And that's for if the plane crashes. Uh, but I can't find that switch in here anywhere. So I'm going to go with it being the emergency lights, and then if we end up, if it, it turns out that uh, there's a there's another checklist item for the emergency lights, well then I'm obviously wrong, but right click and that's going to close the guard on that and you'll be just fine. Engine auto start switches need to be on and the guard closed. Uh, there is no guard on this, but this is the auto start switch here. Now I actually just put this in here using the um, uh, PMDG options function. You can also uh, remove that if you don't want to have the auto start in there. So it will auto start even without that switch in there. Well, we did it yesterday. So, And then we move to our electrical panel. Okay, and that's again this panel right here. And we need to set this bad boy up. So standby power selector needs to be on auto. That's this one. Uh, let's see. Utility power switches both need to be on and verify that the off lights are extinguished. That's these two here. Off lights are extinguished. Battery switches on and off light is extinguished. That's in the middle. We obviously have that one on. Bus tie switches need to be auto and verify that the isolation lights are extinguished. That's these four down here. And they are as required. Uh, next is the generator control switches. They need to be on and verify that the off lights are illuminated. That's these four. They're all on and the off lights are illuminated. Below that, uh, it says verify that the generator disconnect drive lights are illuminated. That's these four down here, and the drive lights are all illuminated on those. And then it says APU selector, if needed, start then on. That's up over here. We're not going to turn on the APU right now, so we don't need to worry about that. And that takes us down to our hydraulic panel, which is right below it. So demand pump selectors all need to be off. That's these four here. These are the demand pump selectors. I was confused about that earlier, obviously. Uh, verify that the hydraulic system fault lights are illuminated and that the demand pump pressure lights are illuminated. So both of these lights for all four should be illuminated, which they are. Next is going to be the engine pump switches all need to be on and then, it's, and then we want to verify that the pressure lights are illuminated. And then there you go, emergency light switch armed guard closed. That's this guy up over here. So I don't, I can't find the ELT switch in here. So maybe I'm just an idiot and can't see it or something. But I looked on all the overhead panels. I looked on all the panels down below, and I, either I'm just overlooking it or they didn't put it in here. So it is what it is. Okay, uh, observers audio system switch normal. I think that's one's up top, and then you get the. Uh, service. Oh, this is the observer audio system right here, actually. So normal, so you get captain, FO, and then normal. And then below that is the service interphone switch needs to be off. That's this one here. And the cargo interphone switch as needed. Uh, we could turn it on because we're going to be loading cargo here pretty soon, so we'll just switch it on for now, and that's fine. Fuel transfer main 1 and 4 switch needs to be off. That's this one here, and it's off. If it was on, there would be some form of light on there, right? And then it says to set the fire panel. So engine fire switches all need to be in. That's these four here. They're all in the in position. Uh, bottle A discharge and bottle B discharge lights are extinguished. If they weren't, we'd see them on there. 
APU bottle discharge light is extinguished. Again, if it wasn't, we'd see the light on there right now. And APU fire switch is in. That's this one down here, which it is. And then car cargo fire discharge light extinguished. Cargo fire depression discharge lights extinguished. Cargo fire arm switch is off. Again, no lights, nothing like that. So we're good on all of those. And then uh, that takes us down to the engine start panel. So that, that's the one right below it, engine start panel. And it says start switches are in, which they are. If they were out, then we'd have white lights on them. And then verify that the start lights are extinguished. That's the white lights I was talking about. Standby ignition selector needs to be to normal. Uh, which one's standby? This guy over here. Standby ignition, ignition selector is normal. Continuous ignition switch is off. So that would be on. That is off. And auto ignition selector is supposed to be on single, which it is. And then it's kind of weird. It says auto ignition selector single and then auto ignition selector one or two. I think that's referring to this switch over here. So we'll leave that one as is in the, uh, it's, no, because that's next. It says auto start switch on. So there's a, obviously a switch that's not up here uh, in this particular model of the aircraft. So that's all right though. Fuel jettison panel, we need to set that. So fuel jettison selector needs to be off. That's this guy right here, which it is obviously. Fuel jettison nozzle valve switch is off and verify that the valve lights are extinguished. That's these two down here, which they are, and they should be guarded as well, but it doesn't say that on here. And then down to the fuel panel, which is right below it. So I was semi-right on my naming of these, right? All cross-feed valve switches need to be on. That's these four here, three and four. Uh, all fuel pump switches off, and then the pressure lights should be illuminated. And then it says, if the APU is running, you verify that the main two aft punch main two aft pump pressure light is extinguished when the APU is running. So main two aft would be this one right here, but the APU is not running, so it's a non-issue for us. Going down to the anti-ice panel, that's what we're calling. That's what this one right here is called, the anti-ice panel. Uh, nacelle anti-ice off and wing anti-ice are both off, and then window heat switches should be on. That's these two here. And then down to the lighting panel, landing light switches are off, runway turnoff light switches are off, and taxi light switches are off. That's all of these down here, and obviously those are all off. And then guess what? We're going to jump back up over to the top over here. So there's a note in here that says, do not push the passenger oxygen switch. The switch causes deployment of the passenger oxygen masks. All right, so there's no passenger oxygen switch in this aircraft because we don't have passengers. It's a cargo variant, but I'm assuming that that switch would be up here on this panel. Uh, let's see. It says that note uh, more than once, in fact. Do not push the supernumerary oxygen switch. It causes deployment of the supernumerary oxygen mass, so that would be this one here. We're not going to press that one, obviously, and that obviously has to do with deployment of masks. Uh, no passenger oxygen switch. Supernumerary oxygen switch needs to be normal and guard closed, which is that one, and the guard is closed. Yaw damper switch is both on, which they are. Make a note if you don't have your IRS turned on uh, and in the alignment mode or in the nav alignment or I don't think it matters. You just have to have them on. The yaw dampers won't come on. Okay, uh, let's see. Therapeutic oxygen switch. Uh, guard closed. There is no therapeutic oxygen switch in here. Cabin altitude panel, that's the next one here, and that needs to be set. So landing altitude switch needs to be to auto. Which one's landing altitude? Cabin control, auto select normal. It doesn't say landing altitude push on. That's all it says. That's kind of it's kind of weird. I don't see an auto function for that. But anyway, moving on. Uh, outflow valve manual switches need to be off. These are the manual switches for the outflow here. Those are off. If they were on, there would be a light on. Cabin altitude auto selector needs to be normal. That's this one over here, and it is. And then down to the ECS panel, environmental control system. So I was pretty close, right? Uh, passenger temperature and flight deck temperature selectors both need to be to auto. So uh, main deck, lower deck, we don't have passengers, so for us it's going to be main deck, lower deck, and then flight deck, and they're all on auto, so we're good on all of those. Zone system light, uh, zone system fault light needs to be extinguished. I don't see a fault light for zone over here, so we're good on that. Trim air switch needs to be on, which it is. 
And upper and lower research fan switches on. There are no upper and lower research fan switches on this aircraft because it's a cargo variant, but those would be on this panel. Keep that in mind. Aft cargo heat switch needs to be off. It is. Equipment cooling selector needs to be to normal. That's this little switch over here, and it is. High flow switch off. It is. And then gasper switch. There's no gasper or humidifier in this aircraft, but both of those would need to be in the on position if you're flying a passenger variant. Okay, continuing on the ECS panel, flight deck fan switches as needed. Um, I don't know. I don't see a flight deck fan. I see this guy here. Hmm. Flight deck temp selector auto. We've already taken care of that. Main deck forward and aft temp selectors auto. We've taken care of that. Zone system fault light extinguished. Why has it got the EC? It's basically got the entire ECS panel twice. It looks like maybe this one is for the cargo variant because it's got trim air and then it goes lower lobe forward and aft temp selectors auto. I don't see those either. So. I don't know, that's kind of weird to me. Anyway, moving down to the bleed air panel. That's what this one's called, the bleed air panel. Uh, pack system fault light needs to be extinguished. They are, it is. Uh, I don't see a fault light, so I guess we're good, right? That would probably be these with these guys down here. Uh, pack control selectors all to normal. Left and right isolation valve switches both on, which that's off, that's on. So it basically it continues the line, right? That's how you know that it's on. Uh, engine bleed air system fault lights extinguished. That would be these guys down here. Those are extinguished. I, I'm assuming that's these ones then. I don't know. Uh, APU bleed air switch on, which it is. And then engine bleed air switches on as well, which they are. And then down to our lighting panel below here, beacon light switch off, navigation light switch as needed. We could turn nav lights on for now. Uh, even though we don't have power on the aircraft yet. Strobe light switch off, wing light switch off, and logo light switch as needed. It's not dark out, so we don't need any of those. And then I would think at this point it would tell us that we need to do the lights test, but it doesn't. So we're going to do it anyway. Right click it, hold your mouse button down and move your mouse away, and then you can let go of the mouse button and all the lights stay on. So you can see we've got all the overhead lights on, we've got all the lights on on the MCP, all the lights on on the center pedestal, and uh, the, all the lights on on the upper upper overhead. So there we go. That takes care of that. It probably comes later in the checklist, and I just haven't found it yet. And uh, what does that take us to? Flight director switch needs to go on. So remember, this is just the first officer right now, not the captain. We'll get to the captains in a little bit, and I'm sure the flight director is going to be one of his checks as well. Okay, IFIS control panel. Minimums reference selector needs to be set to radio or barrel. It's on barrel right now. We're going to leave it there. We're talking about this panel right here. This is your IFIS uh, control panel. Minimums reference selector, decision height or MDA. So what it's telling us is we can select our decision height or MDA, which I guess technically we should for a return to Phoenix, but we're not going to mess with it right now. We're just going to leave it as is. Uh, set decision height or altitude reference. So what it's saying is... Um, so a decision height would be our decision height coming in. You could also set it for an altitude reference for departure. So say we couldn't make a turn until uh, 500 feet. You could scroll this up to 500 feet. Well, let's just say 600. And then it would show on there, and it's just a reminder, right? So I've, I've heard that some, some uh, operators do that. I don't know, but we're not going to mess with it right now. Flight path vector switch is needed. Meter switch, obviously, we don't need that. Um, barometric reference as barometric selector, select inches or hectopascals, so that's the difference between uh, the U.S., which is inches of mercury, and then hectopascals is everywhere else in the world. I don't know why we have to be that different, but anyway. Uh, and then set local altimeter setting, which for us should be uh, 3027. So let's scroll this up to 3027. There we go. It looks like it's probably changed just a little bit. And those should be synced, so that should have changed this one as well, which it did. I've, you can set it so that they're synced, and you can set it so that they're not. It's totally up to you. The VOR ADF switches as needed. We don't need to mess with those. Nav display mode is in map right now. Uh, we don't need the center switch at the moment. Uh, range selector is fine for the moment. Traffic switch as needed. Uh, it's not on, or it is on right now, actually. My apologies. And then weather radar switch needs to be off, which it is. We don't need that right now. 
And let's see, it tells us to set our electronic flight bag or our EFB. We don't have one of those, but we need to we do need to test the oxygen, which is kind of hidden behind the yoke over here. Probably because I shrunk the yoke down, right? Pop that up. There we go. Where's the little it's right there. So you should see that yellow cross and you should hear that sound, and that's how you test your oxygen. Uh, crew oxygen pressure check on the ICUS. So we can check on here under is it status, I think it was. Yeah, oxygen pressure for the crew 1830. So now I wonder if it wants us to do those together. It doesn't. It just shows it as another checklist item, and it says to note the oxygen pressure. So I don't know if that's supposed to change when you do this test. Let's see, it does. It went down to 1820. Fantastic. So if I do it again, I'm just seeing it. If I can bleed the pressure down a little, <laughs> doesn't look like it's bleeding down anymore. So anyway. So we've checked that. Uh, let's see, emergency tests, selector, push and hold. I don't think that works. Do 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 do. Boy, that's pretty extensive actually for the oxygen test. We're not gonna we're not gonna go too crazy with it there. We've tested our oxygen. I think we're good to go. So, moving on. Flight director source is good. Navigation source is good. Uh, EIU source is good. IRS source selector. Uh, it's just going back and forth now. Air data source selector is good. Clock needs to be set. I never mess with the clock, so I'm just going to leave the clock as is. Uh, what else we got here? Flight instruments check. Um, we don't have any hydraulics, so what do you want me to do for a flight instruments check? Won't work, right? No, see, this will move because my controller moves, but the flight instrument. Oh, hold on. Don't mind me. I'm retarded. Flight instruments, not flight controls, right? Somebody was probably yelling at me, so <laughs> verify that the flight instrument indications are correct, meaning our altitude is correct. It's showing our speed should be sitting at uh, 30 knots until we start to move beyond that. Uh, only the following flags shown, TCAS off and no V-speeds until takeoff V-speeds are selected. We've already selected our V-speeds, so those are in there. And then um, TCAS is not off. We've got it on right now, actually. So. And then verify that the flight mode enunciators are correct. Auto throttle mode is blank. That's this one here. And then we should have toga and toga. And then status is flight director here. We've got all of that. So that's, that is as it should be. Uh, ground proximity panel set. So that's this, stuff, that's this little panel down here. Uh, ground proximity light is extinguished, which it is. Ground proximity flap override switch is off, which it is. That's this one here. Uh, gear override switch is off. That's the one next to it. And then uh, the terrain override switch is off as well. And then alternate flaps and gear are set. We don't mess with those. That's up under here. This is the alternate gear. This is the alternate flaps. And we're not going to mess with those. Okay, next is making sure that the landing gear lever is down, which it is. Alternate flap selector is off. We've already gone over that one, but apparently we got to do it again. Alternate flap arm switch is off as well, and then alternate gear extended switches are also off. That's these two down here at the bottom, and they are. Well, what do we got next here? CRT brightness control, we don't need to worry about that. Heading reference switch is normal. FMC master selector is fine. ICUS display, we need to check that. Oh, I guess I already went over that more than once, didn't I? I just lost my place. <laughs> Okay, upper ICUS display check. Verify that the primary engine indications display existing conditions, which they do, and that no exceedance is shown. Well, they're not doing anything, so they're good. Secondary engine indications, that's down here. Should be on the lower ICUS, right? Yeah, lower ICUS, second in secondary engine indications check. Verify that they are displaying existing conditions and no exceedance is shown. And then we go into radio tuning. No smoking selector uh, and seatbelt signs on auto. Those are the two up here, which we've already put. Are they up here? I don't remember. I'm losing my mind here now. <clears throat> no, those are not up here. Those are down below, which should be way back here. There we go. Those two are supposed to be on auto. I don't know why. I just, I'm like losing my mind here or something. Moving on. Uh, auto brake selector needs to go to RTO. That one is back here as well, all the way back here. You have to left click it. The scroll wheel doesn't seem to work on it. Could just be in my sim, but scroll wheel is not working in my sim. Adjust your seat, adjust your rudder pedals, and uh, that takes care of the pre flight procedures for the first officer and is going to move us into pre flight procedures for the captain. 
So for the most part, it's the same stuff as we had to do for the first officer, but there'll be a couple things that are different on here. So starting off with our IFAS control panel, our minimums reference selector needs to be on radio or barrel. We're gonna leave it on barrel for now. And uh, decision hider MDA needs to be set. That's already taken care of because we've got both sides linked up anyway. Uh, flight path vector is fine. Meter switch is fine. Uh, we are on inches of mercury, not hectopascals. VOR and ADF, VOR and ADF switches are fine. Nav, nav display is on map for now. We don't need the center switch. We don't need the range selector to be moved. Not at the moment. We might change it, but <clears throat> not right now. Uh, weather radar switch is off. What else? Flight director needs to come on. Auto throttle switch needs to be armed. Which is a little different. Oh, it was already armed. Which is a little different than the procedure in some other aircraft where you don't arm it until you get near the runway, but whatever. Bank limit selector needs to be to auto. And that's this guy right here, and it is in auto, so we're good on that. Uh, autopilot disengage bar is up. That's this one over here. And then it says to set up the EFB. Obviously, we don't have one in here. We do need to test our oxygen on this one as well. There it is. Oxygen is working just fine. Then what's next on here? <clears throat> it's all the same stuff for the oxygen test too, which there's quite a bit on here. We're not going through all of it. Um, it's a flight sim, so I'm not worried that I'm going to pass out in the aircraft, so I think we'll be good on that. <laughs> uh, what do we have next here? Check the ICAS. That's for pressure. Uh, flight director, source selector left. We're good on that. Navigation, source selector, FMC left. That's correct. EIU and IRS selectors are correct. Air data source selector is correct set the clock we're not messing with the clock and crt select panel inboard crt normal it's talking about uh, these guys down here right so i don't actually know what these do to be honest with you i thought they were supposed to change the brightness or something but obviously i don't know so <clears throat> anyway moving on uh, let's see, TCAS, flight instruments check, verify that the flight instruments indications are correct. Same things we did on the other side, make sure our altitude's correct. Looks like our altimeter's probably changed a little bit, but uh, this has been, I had to pause for a little while anyway. <clears throat> so that's probably going to be a little bit different, but uh, our heading should match up with this one over here, 079 degrees right now, altitude's good. And we'll leave 3027 on there for now, and we'll uh, check, I'll try to remember to check again before we actually taxi out. Uh, and then verify that the following flags are shown. TCAS off, it won't be because we've actually got it turned on right now. And then no V-speeds unless you've got them in, uh, in the FMC, which of course we do. So we've got V-speeds showing up as well. Hold on. <coughs> Captain Max sneeze for you there. Whew. I'll tell you what, that was a good one too. Uh, auto throttle mode should be blank. That's this one here again. Then you should have toga, toga, and flight director. And we do, so we're good. Auto brake selector to RTL, so it's just the captain double checking it at this point. Uh, what's next? Do, 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 do. Man, this is a long list, isn't it? Speed brake lever needs to be down, which it is. Reverse thrust levers need to be down, which they are. Forward thrust levers need to be closed, which they are. Flap lever needs to be set. Uh, so what it should be, what it means by set is just that it's up and that it matches the indication on here, which it does. So we don't need to worry about that. Fuel control switches in the cutoff position. That's these four down here, and they are. Uh, fuel control switch fire warning lights extinguished. So <clears throat> I'm not sure where the actual warning lights are supposed to be located for these guys. Um, because I've never had f the fire lights come on, right? So I don't know. Uh, I don't know if there's supposed to be lights behind them or something like that, but it says that they're supposed to be extinguished, and since I don't see any lights down here, I think we're good. If they're talking about the ones up top, these four here, obviously they are extinguished, but I don't think that's what they're referring to in this case. Uh, i got to find my place here again. Uh, stabilizer trim cutoff switches guard closed. That's these two switches, the red over here, so the guards need to be closed, which they are, obviously. <coughs> uh, alternate stabilizer trim switch is neutral. Uh, and uh, let me just double check this here. Yeah, um, I don't know which ones the alternate stabilizer trim switches. I looked for a little while and I kind of just got tired of messing with it. I couldn't find it. So I thought maybe it was this one here, but this is... No, it has to be these. Alternate stabilizer trim switches. Neutral, meaning they're in the center. Okay, so I was right. 
I was right, you were wrong. <laughs> Somebody's going, yeah, whatever, dude. Uh, where are we at here? Captain's audio control panel, not worried about that. Adjusting the seat and rudder pedals, not worried about that. And that, ladies and gentlemen, takes care of our pre-flight procedures for the captain and the first officer. Which means, now it's time for the before start procedure. We're actually going to get somewhere on this. Alright, real quick, one thing I want to cover before we actually dive into the uh, before start procedures. I didn't show this earlier because I completely spaced it. But your, our center of gravity had a little arrow next to it, and the number 20 for 20% 20 was much smaller. You have to um, confirm that using the line select key, and then it tells you what your trim is supposed to be. So just remember, you need to confirm that, and then it'll tell you what the trim is supposed to be, all right? Okay, moving on. So, flight deck door is closed and locked. Uh, it says, do the CDU pre-flight procedure. We've done all that. CDU display is set. Normally the pilot flying takes the takeoff reference page and the pilot monitoring selects the legs page. That's how they normally do it. So we've got the takeoff reference page and then over here will be the legs page. However, we've still got uh, chocks connected, ground, uh, ground chocks connected, right? <coughs> and we've also got um, the APU running. So I'm going to leave it on here for now, or we don't have the APU running, we've got ground power connected. So I'm going to leave it on there for now, but we'll put it on the legs page before we actually taxi out. Okay, moving on. MCP needs to be set. So uh, in indicated uh, uh, airspeed. The, the Wow, I'm like tripping over my own tongue here. It's absolutely ridiculous. We need to set the speed on the MCP to the V2 speed uh, for our takeoff reference. And it says it just says V2 on here. I thought it was supposed to be V2 plus 5. That's, that's, that was my understanding of it, but we're going to go with the V2, so 152 knots. It's the other way there, yoo -hoo. <coughs> There we go, 152 knots on that. Arm LNAV and VNAV if needed, so we'll arm both of those. And, and sometimes your LNAV won't arm up if your, um, if your initial way, if your first waypoint, I think it is, is too far off a center line or something like that. I don't know. So if it doesn't arm up, don't sweat it. Just double check and make sure you don't have any flight plan discontinuities or vectors as your initial um, uh, initial waypoint, right? So vectors means that obviously you're not flying LNAV, you're flying vectors based on what ATC tells you. <coughs> okay, moving on. Uh, initial heading or track is set. So for us, it's just going to be runway heading. I haven't pulled it up yet. Uh, because I haven't even pulled up the charts yet. So we'll get to that in a little bit. And then we need to set the initial altitude. So we said we're going to flight level 380. And so that's what I'm going to set for now. But again, I haven't looked at the departure or anything like that yet. So until I get a chance to look at that, I won't know if there's an altitude restriction that we need to concern ourselves with. Okay, moving on. Taxi and takeoff briefings. Those will both take place. Uh, taxi and departure briefing take place as we taxi out. That's how I do it on my videos. So those will come in a little bit. Exterior doors, we want to verify those are closed. There's two different ways we can do that. We can go to the doors page on the lower uh, ICUS display here, and it shows that the doors are closed. It appears that they're not armed. I don't know. But we can also go in here, and we can go to the doors page. And so entry one, if it says open, that's what you want it to do, right? And then close all is not even uh, highlighted, so obviously there aren't any doors open. But if a door was open, it would say close instead of open. Right? So it's not telling you what the p condition that it's in, it's telling you the condition you want to put it in. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Okay, let's put that back down there. And where are we at on here? We don't need pushback, so we will need to get start clearance. We'll get into that in a few minutes here. Uh, and then we need to set our hydraulic panel. And there's a note here, a couple of notes actually. First of all, a warning that says, um, if the tow bar is connected, do not pressurize the hydraulic systems until the nose gear steering is locked unwanted tow bar movement might occur so in the real world you want to wait until they tell you that they've locked uh, that they've locked the nose gear steering in place anyway we want to pressurize the number four system first to prevent fluid transfer between systems so number hydraulic demand pump number four goes to auxiliary so that's what we do first is this guy to auxiliary so left click it and put it on auxiliary and then verify that the system fault light and the pressure light, uh, I'm sorry, the system fault light is extinguished, but the pressure light stays illuminated. And then hydraulic demand pumps 1, 2, and 3 all go to auto. And then same thing, the system fault light should extinguish and the pressure light should stay on. And I don't know why it's not extinguishing on number 1 there. <coughs> That's interesting. Let's uh, turn it off. 
and then back on. Hmm, maybe there's a system fault in there. I don't know. I'll have to look into that in a few minutes. That's uh, mildly disturbing, to be honest with you. I know I've got service-based failures turned on, but uh, we've only flown the airplane once. We shouldn't have a fault in the system already. But anyway, moving on for now. Uh, fuel panel, make sure all main tank fuel pump switches are on. So that's these four, or these eight switches here. And then if we get a message on... Um, on the ICAS down here, which right now we've got none, but, well, we've got tons of them, that's the problem. So if we get a message down here on the ICAS that tells us uh, the crossfeed is, uh, there's a crossfeed error, then that has to do with how much fuel is in each tank. And so basically what, well, we're not even going to worry about that unless we have to. It's it's really pretty straightforward, actually. If you've got more in, in the inner tanks than the outer tanks, then you have to have the crossfeeds on. Right, so when we look at this guy here, we've got even across all the tanks. So we're actually going to end up turning the cross feeds off. If there was more on the inner tanks than the outer tanks, then the cross feeds go on. It's pretty simple. Okay, so there's the fuel panel being set. Uh, beacon light switch needs to go to both. Beacon light right here. So you've got uh, right click would be lower, and then left click takes it to both. And then recall switch push. Let's go back to a view where we can see. I got another sneeze coming in here. Cancel, recall again. We still got a bunch of stuff showing up. Makes sense. See now we're getting a we're getting a warning on here. Hydraulic pressure system one. Okay, so there's obviously a problem with uh, the hydraulic pressure in system one, and I don't know what that is. So I'm going to have to explore that. But let's finish our checklist for the moment first, and then we'll dig into that. Uh, everything on here is just about fuel. Cancel switch has been pushed. Trim. We do need to set our trim. So again. We checked it on here, it's 6.1. We can move back here, and boy, that's about as close to 6.1 as you're gonna get. So we're gonna leave that right where it's at. Uh, what else we got? That's the trim, trim is good. And uh, we don't need pushback or towing procedure, we're not worried about that. So that's actually gonna take us all the way up to our engine start procedure, which we're gonna do here in a minute, but first I'm gonna see if I can figure out what's going on with hydraulic pressure system one. All right, so problem solved with the uh, demand pump uh, one for the hydraulics. So first thing I did is I actually dug into the quick reference manual. It turns out that that's a pretty important uh, hydraulic system there as far as flight controls and stuff are concerned. But uh, couldn't seem to get the thing figured out, and then it occurred to me, I'm kind of an idiot, which happens sometimes, it, the APU wasn't on. There's, there's nothing to run the hydraulics. So it's working fine now because I got the APU on. Of course, I didn't go over how to start the APU, but it's actually very simple. You just right-click this knob twice, and once the APU is up and running, you'll see an available light on the APU gens. Click those on, disconnect your external power, which I already did, and you're good to go. And now we are actually ready for our engine start procedure. Now, engine start is actually very simple on this aircraft. After you've gone, gone through and set everything up, that's the key, getting everything set up, which we've done, then it's pretty straightforward. So, first things first. Select the secondary engine indications on the ICAS, which is this down here. So we just want to click on the engine page right here. We want those indications down there, and then we need to set up the packs. So when you set up the packs, you can have two of them on, uh, or I'm sorry, one of them on and two of them off. However, it does recommend that if you're going to start two engines at once, you probably need all the packs off, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to do two engine starts at once, so we're going to have all three packs off. Easy peasy, right? Okay, moving on. Uh, announce start sequence, call start engines. We're going to start engines one and four first. So we're going to pull the engine start switches and then introduce fuel right away because we're on an auto start program here. So you can see the auto start is on. Continuous ignition, we're going to turn that one on as well. And then we're going to go engines one and four. Wait for the light to come on. Maybe. Maybe not. What am I missing here? Getting nothing. Okay. Interesting. So now I feel kind of foolish, but we went through our checklist. We got everything the way we should have it set up. We shouldn't be having an issue here. All of our uh, hydraulics are in the proper position. Uh, packs are off. Maybe it wants me to have one of the packs on. Maybe it maybe it prefers it that way. I don't know. Let's try it again. One and four. Lights aren't coming on. And our N2 is not doing anything. 
Interesting. Okay, so let me see if I can figure out what I did wrong, and I'll come back and I'll let you know. Uh, so I didn't do anything wrong, except that I didn't come and introduce the fuel basically right away. So there should there's supposed to be a light that comes on, um, but for whatever reason it's not coming on. So check it out. We go one and four. Left click them both. Come down here and introduce fuel right away. Okay, introduce fuel, and you'll see here, just like that, bam, the N2 kicks in. Now I didn't go, I didn't look, but perhaps the light's on now. Yep. See now the lights come on. So I guess that's the light doesn't come on until you introduce the fuel. And another way of doing it is I can just have the fuel turned on right now. So I can turn two and three on, even though I'm not starting those engines yet, right? Because I don't have the starter switches on. So the the N2 indication and the fuel flow indication popped up, but it's not doing anything right now because I don't have the starter switches on. So not a problem. Now, as those are coming up and stabilizing, I just want to show you here two things. The fuel tank, uh, you know what, I'm going to leave that one. The fuel, uh, the FMC message, that's going to pop up no matter what. It's going to keep popping up because we use the cold and dark uh, uh, preset from the FMC. So apparently that's an error that uh, they know about and are familiar with, and they're just, I don't know if they're not doing anything about it or what, but we're going to see FMC message pop up even when there's no FMC message. So we're just going to have to deal with it. All right. Engines are stabilized. Let's go ahead and let's start two and three. Same thing. Now, I've already I've already put the fuel condition levers to the on position. So these should light up. Two and three. There we go. They light up. All right. So now engines two and three are starting. We'll let those spin up and stabilize. I'll adjust my uh, checklist here. Oy, oy, oy. So we're getting the hydraulic uh, pressure demand for warning on here. That'll go away when we t take it off of auxiliary. All right, so I'm not worried about that. So there's the starters kicking out or cutting out. Alright, while those are coming up to stabilize, let's start taking a look at our before taxi procedure, which is also our after start procedure, right? So APU selector needs to go to the off position. Now we're no longer using the bleed air pressure from the APU at this point. The, the engines are just stabilizing. So we can go ahead and we can turn the APU off. There we go. And then hydraulic demand pump selectors all need to go to auto. Well, all of them are except for four. So we can put four on auto and that pressure light will go away here shortly. There it goes. The cell anti-ice switches as needed. We don't need them right now. We don't need to have cargo heat pack selectors all go to normal. So we'll put two and three to normal because I had left one on after trying that out to fix the uh, issue for the startup. Well, it wasn't really an issue. It was just confusion. Uh, verify that ground equipment is clear and then call for flaps for takeoff. So we're going to be doing flaps 10 for takeoff. So there's 5 and 10. There's our flaps 10. We'll let those come in. And they do come in rather slow while we're sitting here on the ground. So uh, flight controls check. So to check the flight controls, you want to put this on the status page. It's the top right button here. Maybe. There we go, and then I'll pop it up so that you can see it a little bit better. Here's your flight controls here, so we want to go full left. And I know that they do this a little bit slower, but it's a flight sim. Full right, all the way up, all the way down, neutral, and then rudder, full right. Actually, it should have been full left and full right. But either way, full left and neutral, flight control check complete. Let's put that back on the engine page for now. Do, 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 do. Transponder as needed. We haven't set that yet, so let's zip over here. Here's the transponder. You guys know what I'm going to set. 2336, three, as I always do. There we go. Transponder set. I don't think it ever had us do a test of the TCAS, did it? I don't think it did. I don't recall doing a TCAS test. Press the button in the middle of the little lever there. That'll take care of your TCAS test. I don't recall if we did it or not, so we'll do it now. All right, what do we got next here? EFB airport map. That's not going to apply to us because we don't have an EFB. And then it says 
ask for the before taxi checklist. Now keep in mind that uh, I don't have checklists in here. I'm actually using the FCOM. I couldn't find a checklist in here. Now I do have my own checklist. Let's take a look at that real quick. What we got on our uh, before taxi checklist. Let's see. Taxi clearances requested and received. Taxiways are noted. Ground guidance, we don't need it. Flight controls are free and correct. We don't need a handoff. Uh, landing lights do not go on. I don't know why it's saying landing lights on there. Strobe light doesn't go on. Uh, that's all up to position and hold. But we can turn the taxi lights on. We've got our engines up and running now, so we can turn the wing lights on. Logo lights don't need to go on. And that's it. We're ready to taxi out, folks. So I'm going to get my track IR turned on. Hop back on here, and away we go. All right, we're ready to get this bird in the air. Let's go ahead and get track IR on. Big jump here. There we go. And I got the throttle set. Let's get that parking brake off. It is fantastic. And let's get a little thrust in there. She's not near as heavy as the flight that I did yesterday, but she's still going to be pretty heavy. So we'll see how it goes here. I have switched us to runway 25 right because it occurred to me while I was getting my track IR and stuff set up that... It doesn't make a lot of sense to use 2.5 left, especially when we're using a D-rated thrust, when 2.5 right has so much more runway available to us. So, I can't tell if that guy's taxiing back or what. I sure hope he is because 2.5 uh, left and right and 2.6 are the active runways for landing and departure right now. So, this beast slows down extremely quickly when you pull the throttles back. So, it's something to keep in mind because you want to try and use your throttles to control your speed rather than your brakes. Especially noting that this aircraft, the brakes overheat very easily. Now, cool little note though, if you overheat the brakes, they will turn orange. So, if you're looking outside the aircraft and you've got overheated brakes, Oh, there's that stupid reverse thrust kicking in again. You see that? Look, then it did it on four. Now it's doing it on four again. Stop. So obnoxious. I have no idea what's causing that. It's something to do with my throttle. I've got reverse thrust turned off on this thing, on the throttle. So, I don't know. It's really, it's ridiculous, guys. Look, they're landing on the wrong stinking runways now. You know what? Real quick here, before we finish taxiing out. See, there's... Oh! That reverse thrust is really starting to tick me off. It's like really ticking me off. Look, it keeps going into reverse. Whoa! Come on! And in a tutorial of all times. Okay, track iron going off for a second. It's just ridiculous. It's whatever this stupid glitch is, it's making a freaking engines go into reverse thrust. I've got it specifically set so that there is no reverse thrust on the throttles. But for some reason, they randomly go into reverse thrust. Oh, it really just, oh, it chaps my hide. All right, looking at the weather here again. The weather says the active runways are 2-5 right and left. So I have no idea why they're landing in the opposite stinking direction. There's another one. Come on. Well, they're not lined up down there. They, they were lined up down here a little bit ago. Track are coming back on. Let's just, let's get across this runway here. Because we have to cross this one in order to uh, get over to 2-5 right. So we could taxi down there. That's where they usually, we'll do that. That's, that's where they usually cross at. You know, it's really ridiculous to see these aircraft land. And, you know, the wind's zero at zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cross over. There it goes again. See? Just ridiculous. Just absolutely ridiculous. Okay. Let's see if we can get this airplane to move normal now. That'd be fantastic. Thanks. We're going to go ahead and we're going to switch it up. And I'll change the, uh, the FMC once we get over here. We're going to go ahead and we're going to use uh, 7 left. The wind is zero at zero, so it's telling me Approach on my uh, active sky Seven. that the active Nine. runways are uh, two five left and right. But clearly, as you can see, the AI traffic is all using the runways on the opposite end. So that's what we're going to do. So we'll cross over here. Hopefully we didn't make him go around. That nonsense with the reverse thrust is really ticking me off, you guys insufficient fuel now 
awesome. I'll deal with that in a minute as well. We'll just change our uh, reserve fuel. We should have plenty of fuel for the flight, but when it keeps going into max reverse thrust on a couple of the engines, that's going to cause an issue, isn't it? Ugh. It's, that's like a huge, that's a massively obnoxious little glitch that I have. Thankfully, it doesn't usually, well, it, they can't go into reverse once you're airborne anyway, or they're not supposed to be able to. So I haven't had that problem in the air, but on the ground, man, that happens a lot, and it just drives me insane. All right, let's clear that message off of there. There we go. We'll get that fixed up here in a second. I'll show you guys. So we're just gonna change the amount of uh, reserve fuel that we're expecting to have. And that should uh, alleviate that insufficient fuel warning for now. Because we put 15,000 pounds of uh, reserve fuel, so I think we'll be fine. So thanks to our ridiculously annoying issue with the throttles going into reverse, I forgot to do the taxi and departure briefing, so we're going to go ahead and take care of those right now real quick since we have a couple aircraft on approach anyway. All right, guys, our taxi was very straightforward. We were on the south cargo ramp over here, so we just headed up, we just hopped over to a hotel. Um, and then originally we were going to come down here, we were going to cross over and take 2-5 right, but we had to change runway, so we crossed over here to Foxtrot, and now we're holding short of 7 left over here. ATIS is on 127.575 with Phoenix clearance on 118.1, ground for us on 132.55, and tower for us is going to be on 120.9. Let's take a look at this departure briefing. 
It's going to be the Chili 4 departure, and because we've switched directions here, don't worry, I took care of everything in the FMC. Everything is set up the way it needs to be. But uh, we're going to be taking off this way. So we need to climb out, uh, climb to 1,550 feet, and then turn to 075 until we get to four nautical miles from Phoenix VOR. Then it's a left turn to heading 045, expect vectors to get on course. So we're basically just going to turn on course from there. That's going to take us to Zephyr, and then Carlo, and then Chile. And then from there, it's out to Hobes for us, and then on course from there. So pretty straightforward. Departures on 119.2, airport elevation is 1135 feet. All right, now that we got the obligatory briefings out of the way, let's go ahead and take care of this uh, takeoff checklist here. First things first, when we get ready to pull on the runway, we're gonna need landing lights and runway turnoff lights on. Goes on. Looks like he's going to get on there before us. He's not going to wait. Strobe lights need to go on as well. Double check. Make sure we got all our lights as we need. We do. Fantastic. We're going to have to wait on him, obviously. That's fine. Auto throttle is already on. Autopilot settings are set. Um, and, yep, we got to wait on him for just a second anyway. So, uh, let's see. Autopilot settings are set. And then it's just... Uh, Wait until 70% N1, toga button, and all that good stuff. All right, to the fun stuff then. Track hire coming on. A little big jump there. And let's get this bird onto the runway and get going. All the aircraft that are on approach are landing on uh, runway 8. So we should be good. He's gone. Thank goodness. There goes reverse again. Ridiculous absolutely freaking ridiculous Approaching. it's not the Zero. aircraft either it's my controls Seven. does it on almost every aircraft I have it's absolutely ridiculous drives me insane I'm not even pulling the throttles all the way back but I'm sure somebody's probably thinking that well you're probably just slamming the throttles all the way back no that's not even when I pull the throttles all the way back it's when I pull them part way back all right on runway. Try not to overheat Zero. the brakes. I did yesterday Seven. when I did the live stream. Nine. And that was just from holding them, uh, like it says, until you hit toga. I don't know. That's kind of weird to me. But anyway, hold them down, bring it up to about 70% in one. Right around there. Let them stabilize for a second. Release brakes, hit toga. And away we go. I hear some screaming in the background. That's one of my kids. 80 knots. Check. Got the ground shake going on. I kind of like it. V1. Oh, yeah, we have plenty of runway. Rotate. V2. Positive rate of climb. You're coming up. There's thrust reduction. Looking pretty good so far. Flaps to five. The one. And flaps up. Now we can start our turn here shortly. We're raising that nose up to reduce speed. There we go. 
There's four from PXR. We can go ahead and start our turn now. Going to expand this out just a little bit so we can see a little better where we're going. Maybe. Oh. Got to watch that nose will drop on you. You got to apply that uh, back pressure on the yoke when you start a turn. That was my bad. I was too busy messing with the range knob. because we have made the first waypoint the primary. Okay, track iron coming off here. Let's get the autopilot on. Actually, I wanted the left autopilot, but that's fine. We'll use the center one for now. And let's go ahead and change Zephyr to our primary waypoint. Go direct to that. There we go. And we're going to cross 10,000 feet here in no time. Again, we're not very heavy, so she's climbing really quickly. Coming up on 10,000. Go and get those landing lights off. Come on. Then we turn off lights and taxi lights can all come off as well. And let's take a look at our after takeoff checklist. Landing lights and taxi lights are off. Autopilot altitude and speed are set. TCAS biasing mode is it's on auto, so there's nothing we can do with it. Uh, engine and wing anti-ice on if we've got we don't need it. Let's just leave it at that for now. Altimeter readjust above 18,000. Continuous ignition can go off. That's uh, this guy right here. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, clearly you need to get this view in order to do that. <laughs> there we go. Continuous ignition is now off. And we are going to go. And that means, ladies and gentlemen, you guessed it. It is time for some of that obligatory elevator music. It's going to be the always one arrival for us again today coming in out here at resume <clears throat> down to diamond over the lane and then to always and then we're going to break off from the arrival there 
because of the approach that we're going to be taking. So that's all we really need out of it. However, we do have some altitude restrictions we want to adhere to. The one here at Diamond, we need to be at or above flight level 270. And then at Lane, we need to be between 260 and 220 and at 280 knots. And then always, and then from there over to our approach. <coughs> So the 8 is going to be 113.7 for us, airport elevation is 13 feet, and off we go. Alrighty folks, we're going to be coming up on our top of descent here pretty quick, so obviously we've got a little bit of work to do before we get to that point. First thing I like to do when I get ready for top of descent is I like to go ahead and reset my MCP altitude, and that way if I get distracted doing other things, the aircraft will start the descent on its own. That's for a Boeing, now for Airbus you still have to press the descent button, so works great in Boeing, doesn't work so great in Airbus, but it is what it is. I'm going to take this down to 5,000 feet, you'll see why when we get to the approach brief. This aircraft really does do a very good job of maintaining altitude restrictions, and I really like that. Okay, so descent preparations. Airport information, we've retrieved that, and we've also retrieved our weather. Uh, the wind is 097 at 3 degrees, very minimal at best. Uh, 3028 on the altimeter, 9 degrees Celsius on the temperature. We need to set the auto brakes. For us, it's going to be auto brakes uh, 2, I believe, will be plenty for this one. Actually, we probably don't even need to go to two, but we'll use two anyway. So auto brakes two, got a little bit of the sniffles going on there. And then we need to set up the FMC. So come down here and hit initial reference. And you can see you've got an option for flaps 25 or flaps 30 landing. So you're either landing at 148 knots or 142 knots. Six knots can make a pretty big difference for a decent landing. And I like to land full flaps anyway. Um, you know, we're not that heavy. The truth of the matter is, is from what I've seen anyway, it looks like most of the... Uh, commercial airlines they don't use full flaps unless they have to especially southwest them boys come screaming in but anyway that's what we're going to go with so we're all set for that it's really as simple as that uh, when when you look at your checklist and it says you go to the arrivals page we've already selected our runway and all that right so 
If we go down in here, departure arrivals page, we've chosen ILS one night or left. Uh, we've already, we're on the always one arrival, so I don't really know why it's not highlighted on there, but it doesn't matter. Either way, uh, that's our runway choice, and that's going to be our landing reference speed. So this is our landing speed. We want to be five knots faster than that on our approach, so 147 on the approach, 142 on the landing. Uh, let's see, <coughs> we will use VNAV for the entire descent, or for the, probably for most of the descent, I don't know about the entire, you know, I forgot to turn landing gear off after we took off. In this aircraft, if you just click on the handle, it'll go to the off position, so something to keep in mind. Uh, <coughs> what else we got here, anything else? Uh, nothing we need to worry about right now. We've got our initial approach checklist coming up next, but before we do that, we need to go ahead and take care of that approach briefing. So even though we're just a little ways out from top of descent still, we're going to go ahead and roll right into that approach briefing, and then uh, I'll throw a little cinematic in there for you guys, and then we'll come back for the initial approach checklist. All right, it's going to be a pretty familiar approach for us. Uh, the ILS 19 left approach, ADIS on 113.7. NorCal approach on 134.5 and San Francisco Tower on 120.5, ground on 121.8. Localizer frequency 108.9 with a final approach course of 194 degrees. Flight slope intercept at shake at 2,800 feet. ILS decision altitude is 300 feet with airport elevation at 13 feet and touchdown zone elevation is at 11 feet. <coughs> if we have to next, F, ugh, if we have to execute a missed approach, which I really hope we don't, uh, we'll climb to 520 feet and then a climbing left turn to 3,000 feet outbound on the San Francisco 101 degree radio from the VOR out to Dumba intersection which is 15 nautical miles out and then Holder is directed by ATC. You can see on our uh, plan view here coming in at CCR short hop over to up end and then down to Burks, Shake, Rogue and then in from there. Burks we need to be at 5,000 feet between there and Shake we descend to 2,800 feet Intercept the uh, glide slope, probably before that, but anyway. Uh, and then rogue from there and on in. Happy lights on the left-hand side. ILS decision out to 300 feet with a minimum runway visual range of three quarters of a mile. Any questions? Of course not. It's a video.
All right, folks, we're just about to make our turn here at CCR and cross below 10,000 feet. So let's go ahead and get the landing lights on, runway turnoff lights on, and let's take a look at this initial approach checklist. ATIS has been obtained. Approach briefing is completed. Decision height is set to our 300 feet on the barrel. Landing data is checked and set. Seatbelt selector is on. ICUS recall, we need to check that. We are going to get that uh, FMC message again. That's going to continue to pop up because of that error with uh, doing the cold and dark function through the FMC. Auto brake selector as required, we've set it to two. Wing lights as required, those are on. Altimeters are set, uh, 3026. And then flaps are as required. So we're actually ready to start our flap schedule here. Let's go ahead and get flap setting, first flap setting in. And we can actually go all the way to flaps 10 where we're at right now as far as our speed is concerned. But uh, when you bring in the flaps, of course, it's going to slow us down. So I think we're good with uh, flaps 1 for the moment. Basically what we need to do is just monitor the aircraft. So we're just about over the bay area here. And you can see... Um, I think well, we should be crossing over Oakland, shouldn't we? Turn the airports on there. Oakland, I know, is extremely close. There it is right there. There's Oakland. We're going to cross right past it. I'll bet that's a pain as far as air traffic control is concerned, right? Dealing with traffic coming in and out of San Francisco and in and out of Oakland at the same time. That's got to be a pain in the butt. All right, uh, so there's CCR coming around to up end here or up end and we need to get down to 5,000 feet at Burks. It's going to be a little tough from Burks to uh, Shake getting down to 2,800 feet. That's a pretty short distance to make that descent but we're going to slow down a little more before we get to that point when we bring in our next flap setting anyway. One of the nice things about uh, having the auto throttle up and running is that when I bring in the flaps it's automatically going to adjust the speed right. So there's flaps 5 and it, it may not adjust it on flaps 5, I don't know. But we were at 220 and it adjusted to 202 when we went to flaps 1. So when we go to flaps 10, it may slow down even further. And uh, when we get up to Burks, we'll go ahead and we'll, uh, we'll click on the localizer button. And hopefully uh, we should lock on shortly after crossing Burks. There you go, see now it's going down to 182. And we're still on VNAV path, so it's on schedule. Let's go ahead and bring in flaps 10. So as we're flying a little slower, we're losing altitude a little quicker, right? Uh, as far as our horizontal distance is concerned. So, and some of you guys may be familiar with that, some of you guys may not know what the heck I'm talking about. <laughs> we got a little ways to go here yet, um, you know, maybe came on just a little early, so I'm going to let it fly out here a little bit, and uh, if there's anything to say, I'll say it, otherwise I'll just cut a little bit of this out so that we're not just sitting here staring at the screen. Alright, so we're just a few miles out from Shake here now, let's go ahead and uh, finish setting up for our final approach here. Uh, we can go ahead and click on the localizer switch over here, it should grab it right away, which it did, and let's click on the glide slope as well. And it's going to grab that one right away as well. So now we're on approach. Traffic. Traffic. And I don't know who that is or what he's doing, but I, you know what? I'm just going to ignore him. I really am. I know that's Why? ridiculous, but. Why? Let's go ahead and get gear down. And this AI traffic is just ridiculous. Look, this guy's coming right in our face here. There he is right there. He's just screaming right up in Increase our face. Climb. Like, Increase seriously. Climb. And why would we climb when he's climbing right now? This Ugh. I hate AI now. traffic sometimes, you guys. I really do. Alright, let's bring it down to 155 here. There we go. Next setting of flaps coming in. And we can bring in one more after that. That's going to take us to flaps 25. And we want to be, what do we say, 147 on our approach. So let's just go ahead and take it all the way down to that. There we go. Bring in full flaps, arm the spoilers. There we go, spoilers are armed, and let's take a look at this uh, final approach slash landing checklist. Flaps are down, coming into 30 right now, gear is down and locked, speed brake is armed, ILS is captured. We're not going to disengage autopilot quite yet, or autothrottle or anything like that. 
Uh, and that's it. Then it just tells you kind of how to land. So we're pretty much good to go there. Let's go ahead and get the proper view here. Track hire coming on. Little jump. And you can't see the runway right now. So let's talk about auto land for a second. If we're going to auto land, we got to have all three autopilots on. As soon as it intercepted the glide slope, it automatically engaged the other two Traffic. autopilots. Traffic. Oh, these guys are killing me here. What is he landing on the other runway over there? There's an airplane down there taking off. Wow. Anyway, so right now we've got no visibility on the runway. It's foggy out. That's not what the weather said, but that's what we have. So this airplane will auto land itself. All we have to do is sit here and stare at it. We may end up doing that. I don't know. We'll see. Depends on how low we get. If we get all the way down to minimums, we still can't see the runway. You guys are going to witness an auto land during this full flight tutorial. So nothing else to do really except stare at it. I mean, we're not that far out from the runway at this point. We're, uh, what, a little over six miles out, six and a half miles out. Looks like maybe we're just starting to see some of the lights cracking through the fog up there. When I did the live stream yesterday, I ended up, uh, ended up hand flying an approach after, going, after having to do a go around because some idiot was sitting on the runway. I can see the runway lights now. I can see the pappy lights anyway, but I can't see the runways clearly. There's another aircraft right here, or a bird. Apparently there's birds in this sim. Is that a bird or an airplane? That's a bird. Yep, look, there's a bird, guys. There's a couple of them out here. Look at that. Let's hope he doesn't go through our engine, huh? Looks like he's just kind of hanging out there. He's looking at us, and he disappeared. <laughs> I've seen birds a few times in this one now. It's kind of interesting, actually. All right, so we still don't have good visibility on the runways. There's no way we're going to turn off the autopilot at this point because we can't see the runways well enough to, to have good control of the aircraft, right? I, I swear it looks like we're it looks like we're all lined up right between them, doesn't it? Oh man, we might be able to pull the autopilot off here shortly. We're getting, getting pretty close to being able to see it clearly, huh? Now with the throttles, you can leave the auto throttles on and then and then they'll cut out when you pull the throttles back on flare. Okay, I think we've got good enough visibility now. Let's go ahead and take the autopilot off. It loves the nosedive when you first press that autopilot off button. I don't know why. I think it's my yoke, to be honest with you. Alright, we're looking good though. Approaching. One. Nine. I hate the water here. I have tried to change the settings and everything and it always looks really crummy like that. I really hate the water here. It's ridiculous to me. Yeah, we're just a hair to the right. And other than the water making you feel nauseous, uh, everything's looking good. I, I really hate that water. And I turned off the special Four effect hundred. that was Plus supposed hundred. to be part of San Francisco. Um, but it still just looks ridiculous. It's, it's just ridiculous. I can't stand it. All right, let's listen to our call outs. Got a little far left there. Two hundred. There we go. One hundred. Fifty. Forty. Thirty. Twenty. Ten. I'm not holding the yoke back. There we go. Thrust coming in. Reverse thrust coming in. Oh, that was a butter landing, folks. Coming up on 80 knots already. Remaining. All right. Take over the brakes. Just make sure the auto brakes turned off. They probably did not. Remaining. We and we'll exit this taxiway here. Try not to go too fast. Nice. That was a nice landing right there. That was beautiful. A little bit of chop in here. There's a lot going on in this scenery. But overall, it wasn't bad at all, huh, guys? Let's get those flaps coming up here. Get those spoilers up. Landing lights can come off. Runway turn off lights off. Probably could have left them on since we have to cross this runway. brakes are going to be a little warm but let's bring her to a stop we'll take care of our after landing stuff here real quick 
and then we can uh, cross them over. Track iron coming off. A little jump there. All right. So after landing checklist slash taxi checklist. Transponder needs to go to standby mode. That's this guy way down here. All the way down into standby. Uh, hand off tower ground. Taxiways flap set to zero. We've done that. They're coming up right now. It's telling us TCAS is off. That's good. Uh, flight directors can come off as well. And that's going to hopefully get rid of some of these warnings. There we go. Uh, speed brake disengage. We did that, right? Yep, we sure did. Uh, auto brakes are off. Landing lights are off. Strobe lights can come off. And yeah, I can never guess which one it is from the side. There we go. Strobe lights. Right click them to turn them off. Fantastic. And then start the APU. So that guy's right here. Right click twice. APU starting up now. And uh, it looks like we got a little uh, Cessna getting ready to take off right there. That's interesting. So that's got to be pretty wild taking off in a Cessna from here, huh? Alright, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait for him to take off, then I'm going to come back on here and we'll taxi, well, I'm going to start taxiing in and then I'll come back on and uh, we'll get everything shut down. Wrap up this tutorial. Approaching zero, one, left. All right, the parking brake is set. APU is up and running. Let's go ahead and get the APU generators on. And we can shut the engines down. Now, we didn't use GSX to load up, and I'm not going to use them to shut down because I've decided that's just a distraction as far as what we're trying to do here. So let's just go ahead and roll right into our uh, parking position checklist here. Parking brake is set. We don't need to worry about ATC contact. APU Gen 1 and 2 are both on. APU bleed needs to be on. That's up over here. And it is now on. Engine bleeds can all go off. Not really sure why that matters, but whatever. Engine hydraulic pumps can all go off. There we go. And uh, actually, that was incorrect. Those are the demand pumps. Put those back to auto. I messed that up. Engine hydraulic pumps are these guys down here, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure... Yeah, those, those are the demand switches. Engine hydraulic pumps are these four down here. My bad. Somebody was yelling at me for that, I guarantee it. Fuel control switches can all be cut off. And we'll get the pressure light. We should get it on all of them except for uh, the aft two main switch there. Uh, fuel control switches are already cut off. Seatbelt signs can go off. Not really worried about that one, but uh, that's down here, guys. So seatbelt signs, no smoking signs off. Uh, open doors. We're not going to open doors right now. You you guys know how to open and close doors already. That's not a big deal. Uh, beacon lights can go off. And I didn't turn my taxi light off when I pulled in again. Big surprise, right? I was just making sure I had that off though. Uh, beacon lights can go to the off. Come on, off position. There we go. Man, I just hate silly little issues. Ground power on if available. So what we want to do is jump down here, go to your menu, FS actions, ground connections. Go ahead and set the chocks and then request ground power and it'll be here in just a second. So we'll bring that on here shortly and then the APU will come off or I'm sorry the APU bleed will come off 
and then followed immediately by the APU. So we'll give it just a second here while it's hooking up. There it is, external power on on both of those. APU bleed off, APU off, fantastic. Yaw dampers both go off. Basically everything's gonna come off at this point, right? So hydraulic demand switches come off. One, two, three, and four. Continuous ignition goes off. We already had it off. Auto start can go off. IRS systems one through three go off. You gotta click them twice. They're kind of slow to go from nav to a line. You can't double click them real quick. Left and right utilities both go off. Uh, all fuel pumps are already off. Cross feeds all need to be on. So make sure all the cross feeds are on. Window heats can come off now. Trying to find my mouse there. Engine wing anti-ice off. We didn't use it on this flight. Aft cargo heat off. Uh, let's see. So we never turned aft cargo heat on. We never even had a thing to turn it on. Trim air can go off. We probably should have turned it on, huh? Gasper. There is no Gasper in here. Upper and lower recirks. There are none in here. Packs one through three can go off. One, two, and three. Isolate left and right isolation switches both go off. Generator control switches go off. That's these four over here. Basically, like I said, you guys, you're just shutting everything down. TCAS is already in standby. APU is already off. Now ground power can come off at this point. So turn off external power. Turn off all external lights. <coughs> and turn off the battery. Right click that. Battery off. And bus tie switches off. Actually, it should have been bus tie switches, standby power selector, then battery. My bad. I got ahead of myself. And that's going to wrap it up for this full flight tutorial, ladies and gentlemen, for the PMDG 747. As with all of my tutorials, I stumbled around with a little of this and a little of that. But anybody who knows me knows that I fly a ton of different aircraft, and that's part of the reason why I see, I, I just I get confused sometimes. I don't know how else to put it. I, I'm so used to flying so many different airplanes. It's kind of a pain in the butt. But I think we got the gist of it on this one, and that was the idea. Uh, following these, these procedures, you should be able to take the aircraft from cold and dark all the way through a flight and back to cold and dark. And that's what we're trying to accomplish with a full flight tutorial. So I do hope that this one was helpful for you. Again, it does not encompass every aspect of this aircraft. Well, it doesn't even come close to encompassing every aspect of this aircraft. So if you guys are interested in some advanced flight tutorials in this airplane or any others, let me know down in the comments section. If I've got enough interest, I'll definitely look into doing that. Um, but advanced flight tutorials are far going to be would be far more in depth and require several tutorials for a single aircraft. So just keep that in mind. But if that's something uh, you guys are interested in, we'll look at doing that. Uh, and that's it, folks. If you haven't already done so, please go ahead and smash the subscribe button. Over 5,500 subscribers now, and I'm, I continue to be humbled by that. I appreciate every one of you. I appreciate all of the support that you guys give me, and I look forward to uh, many, many more videos and many more years of continuing this. It's a lot of fun, and I enjoy it, and I, and I hope that you guys do too. Uh, go ahead and like us over on Facebook. You'll want to do that if you're interested in seeing live streams at all because that's where my live stream announcements take place. It is true I will occasionally do a live stream without, without announcement. I've done that a couple times here recently. However, typically I announce on Facebook and I stream on Twitch. So keep that in mind. Hop on over there. There's an announcement on there right now and it's set up as an event. So make sure you go to the events page. You can also follow us on Twitter. I haven't really done much on there, but I'm hoping to get a little active on there. Follow us on Twitch at CaptainMac3588 so you can get involved in those live streams. And that's going to wrap it up for this one. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, keep the blue side up, unless otherwise instructed by ATC. God bless you all, and have a fantastic day.